So now we're going to welcome Dr. Anne Holdway. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. From the Man Hello. Nutrition Pathway. Hello. Who's been doing Hi. such good work for such a long time. So I think we're going to be really interested to hear what you're going to be talking about today. Oh, thank you so much, Over Leslie. Um, well, firstly, um, I'd like to thank Leslie and all of the team at HUK uh, for really inviting me today to present uh, and give an update really about where we are with the Malnutrition Pathway resources and tools. And uh, we're currently celebrating 10 years of trying to raise awareness of disease related malnutrition. And just for those who are listening in, um, the focus for the Malnutrition Pathway has always been on uh, looking at disease related malnutrition, although we know there's an awful a lot of overlap between aging, disease related malnutrition and also social malnutrition. Uh, just to say first, in, in terms of uh, disclosures, I do obtain speaker fees and honoraria from, uh, for advisory board work. Uh, and focus group research uh, and educational resource uh, funds from Nutricia Danone Abbott and Nutrinovo. Um, so just to declare those. Um, what I'm going to hopefully give you insights into today is really the evolution of the Malnutrition Pathway tools and resources, um, which have always been to support the aims uh, of uh, optimizing nutritional care for all of our patients and clients that health and care professionals come into contact with every day. So the aims of the pathway uh, and what hopefully I'm going to tell you about today is how the pathway has worked to assist the multidisciplinary team to embed nutrition into care pathways and help individuals at risk of malnutrition, self-care and improve access to the information that can help them to improve their nutrition uh, during and after illness and hopefully ensure that healthcare professionals through greater understanding of nutrition uh, can apply that in practice to address, address nutritional issues uh, to hopefully improve patient function, quality of life, and reduce the uh, social and healthcare so costs associated with malnutrition. So just to give you a little bit of a background to the Malnutrition Pathway resources, because 10 years on, sometimes the history is lost. Um, but the Malnutrition Pathway uh, really uh, evolved from uh, the nutrition support guidance that was published in 2006 and subsequently added to that was the quality standards in uh, 2012, which uh, really highlighted the need to both screen uh, uh, for malnutrition and then treat it through the most appropriate method. Now, when we look at how we might tackle malnutrition and particularly disease-related malnutrition in the community, uh, we know that dietitians are qualified to uh, provide nutritional care and undertake complex assessments with patients with uh, uh, multiple conditions. Um, but we're in uh, short supply. And with 3 million people malnourished or at risk of malnutrition in the UK, many of whom are living in the community, and only about 11,000 dietitians uh, registered in the UK, many of whom might not be working in clinical care or might be part time, then you can see that the numbers don't add up, that dietitians um, could not see all of the patients who are at risk of malnutrition or who are malnourished. And therefore, the skills of dietitians are very much focused on managing the more complex patients. And so if we're to effectively treat and prevent malnutrition, then really we need to involve a broad range of health and care professionals. And that was really uh, why we started to look at a national resource for tackling malnutrition. Historically, uh, we know BAPEN's been running for about 30 years, and I know you heard from Trevor Smith earlier today. And, and initially, we very much focused our efforts uh, in BAPEN and as healthcare professionals on tackling malnutrition and screening for it in hospitals. But we know with hospital stay being around about six days or less, um, you know, we cannot tackle malnutrition in hospital alone. And we might identify it there, but it's often developed insidiously for weeks or months prior to admission. And that therefore provides an opportunity for the community care professionals to actually intervene at an earlier time before a person ends up in hospital. But also that effective nutritional support might be hampered in hospital and fills a 
obviously just talked about the amazing work around um, NHS England and what we're trying to do to improve intake through food. But we know sometimes in hospital patients have a very poor appetite and with the best will in the world, nutrition support might not reverse malnutrition when they're in hospital. Uh, and therefore we need to continue nutritional support beyond the hospital doors uh, for when a patient comes home. So emphasizing the need for uh, nutrition information for healthcare professionals working in the community to support those once a patient's discharged or to prevent them coming in in the first place with malnutrition. Um, now, the need for a national resource and the development of malnutrition pathway was also underpinned by two key pieces of work that underta were undertaken in 2011-2012. One was a survey by Kate Ashben uh, that looked at uh, GP knowledge and awareness of NICE guidance and whether GPs felt they had access to the right information. And it showed uh, from that study that only about 10% of GPs were using a validated screen tool. That survey was also accompanied by some re research that I undertook myself, where I looked at uh, all of the sort of uh, guidance around the UK uh, that was intended to help community healthcare professionals uh, screen and treat malnutrition. And of the 42 guidance documents I was able to identify and uh, uh, analyzed through a qualitative review, uh, we saw huge variation in the length with some extending to around 80 pages or more, so not exactly a succinct guide for our community healthcare professionals, and they often offered inconsistent advice uh, with scant use of the evidence, and they were very variable in terms of the advice that was contained within the guidance to actually tackle malnutrition. When uh, Kate Ashman asked GPs what would help them implement the NICE guidance, then one in five of them identified a pathway for care, along with training and education, uh, prescribing guidelines for oral nutritional supplements, information so they could give dietary advice to patients, and a guide to oral nutritional supplements. So these are some of the issues that GPs uh, identified would help them uh, identify malnutrition and actually provide some appropriate advice for their patients. And as we know, GPs often have to do that within about seven to 10 minutes. Um, so hence why many more healthcare professionals now are being encouraged to get involved in the nutritional care of patients because we know we can't rely on GPs alone. So as a consequence of those two key uh, uh, pieces of research that was uh, undertaken uh, uh, just over a decade ago, a national panel of experts was brought together to really develop a practical guide and a practical tool and resources to help community healthcare professionals screen and uh, identify malnutrition and go on to treat it. Uh, and the idea was that the guidance that was developed needed to be evidence-based, educational, concise, easy to use, logical, include a pathway for care, and incorporate escalation management, for example, to dietitians. So the outcome uh, was the man managing adult malnutrition in the community guidance uh, and uh, accompanying resources that was launched in 2012. Uh, there was the hard copies as well as the website that was developed and uh, an example of some of the materials are included here. The resource itself, that when it was originally launched, incorporated a range of oral nutritional support solutions based on very much what dietitians do in practice, but also what was identified in NICE guidance for oral nutritional support. And to make information accessible by community healthcare professionals, the pathway included some free to download resources for patients and carers that healthcare professionals could pass on to the patients and carers or patients and carers could access themselves. Now, we know with the best will in the world, when patients are unwell, have a poor appetite, um, that uh, despite our best efforts, uh, intake from food may still remain inadequate and therefore there may be a need for oral nutritional supplements. So to guide our community health and care professionals to uh, try and select the most appropriate oral nutritional supplements when they were needed, we produced an at-a-glance overview of the oral nutritional types, including the liquids, powders and desserts and all the various formats that they came in uh, that's in the library of resources on the Malnutrition Pathway website. Uh, but we do encourage professionals to also refer to their local formularies. 
So 10 years on, uh, we've not stood still. Uh, we have continued to evolve the resources within the malnutrition pathway and feedback from end users has led to uh, really a continuous update and the creation of new resources in, in response to requests, which include um, uh, items such as dysphagia management, top tips for various healthcare professionals, um, and top tips for care homes, as well as GPs, speech and language therapists, and nurses. Uh, we also have developed some disease-specific guidance, uh, for example, the COPD guidance and the optimizing nutritional care in cancer, uh, therefore trying to meet the uh, requirements for these ever-increasing uh, numbers of patients with these conditions. And we've created care plans as a framework for care homes, as an example. And during COVID-19, we were fortunate to pull together a, a panel that uh, rapidly produced some COVID-19 resources that were actually uh, highlighted by the World Health Organization and were actually taken up across the globe. Um, these examples here are some of the top tips that have been created for specific health and care groups. So, for example, the resources specifically developed for care home staff and also on the right here, the top tips for uh, GPs. But there's many others on the website. Uh, we've involved patients and carers in the update of our patient care information leaflets and now have uh, 20 leaflets for patients and carers to use uh, in everyday practice. And in recognition of the emergence of the nutrition care process that's been adopted worldwide by dietitians, but also mirrors uh, the care process that uh, is um, uh, employed by many healthcare professionals. That's the fourth step to screening, assessment, management, and uh, monitoring. We've actually uh, uh, in integrated assessment into the updated version of the malnutrition pathway. And this is really to help uh, care professionals who are non-expert in nutrition uh, to take into account the clinical history, weight change, diet recall, and make connections between the symptoms that might be interfering with food intake uh, in an individual to help the care professional co-create an individual care plan. So the 2021 update of the Malnutrition Pathway adopted this four-step process of screening, assessing, planning care, setting goals, and monitoring progress. And an example there is uh, the page on assessment that's now uh, within the Malnutrition Pathway main guidance. The actual assessment looks to help health and care professionals uh, really identify the issues that might be interfering with an adequate intake, as well as be indicative of malnutrition and therefore warrant further investigation. So there are really prompts within the guidance now to help care professionals identify the sort of things that they can make a difference to so that when we come to give advice about oral nutritional support we can begin to address the plethora of issues that some of our patients experience on a daily basis to hopefully help them overcome those issues so that they can uh, improve their intake and enjoy their food more. Um, a specific uh, development in the past year has been the development of the cancer resources, and there's some examples here. And this is a very specific uh, disease area where we know nutritional issues are commonplace. So many of the resources that have been developed for the cancer pathway, uh, such as loss of taste and taste change, reduced appetite, they're very common to many other clinical conditions. So although they were developed as part of the cancer pathway, um, we do find that they're very relevant to managing disease-related malnutrition for many other medical conditions. Also in the 2021 update of the main guidance uh, and other accompanying resources, we tried to encourage a greater focus on the creation of goals that are created uh, with the carer and the patients. Uh, and that means talking to the patients and the carers in the right language. So there's some examples here of what we might set as healthcare professional goals, but how that translates into uh, the goals that are really important to our patients. With increasing emphasis on the combined effect of protein and resistance training, um, we've also uh, introduced new resources on the management of sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle mass that we observe with aging or illness and uh, chronic conditions, particularly those that have an inflammatory component, such as cancer uh, and COPD. Uh, and we've got new resources 
on how patients can improve their protein intake and embedded within those resources and in the pathway is ideas on increasing activity in conjunction with an adequate protein intake because we know that uh, both uh, that dual effect uh, will look to improve muscle mass and therefore hopefully preserve function. Uh, mainly uh, Hilary Franklin, uh, who I must give great credit to, has done a huge amount to promote the guidelines and we've had many articles published over the years in the medical press and in peer-reviewed journals through the collaborative approach uh, uh, utilising Hillary's uh, skills in PR, but also uh, input from many of the expert panel members to produce the actual guidance uh, and the articles. And I'm pleased to say that the uh, malnutrition pathway uh, was used as a, te a template for the uh, guidelines for nurses and e-guidelines. Uh, an example is shown there. Visits to the website have increased uh, year on year, and this slide here just shows you the exponential growth that we've seen over the last 10 years, and we're now uh, increasingly seeing visitors across the globe uh, utilising and accessing the resources. And uh, during the past year, we've monitored the uptake of the malnutrition pathway, and we're aware that the resources uh, have been widely adopted uh, across the UK. And further studies to evaluate the implementation of the malnutrition pathway guidance and the care plans have demonstrated a reduction in costs and improvements in nutrition. Uh, and that's been demonstrated in a study in an older community population and in another study in patients with COPD. And I believe you're going to hear more from Dr. Abby Corwood shortly uh, about the implementation studies. So the malnutrition pathway resources and tools were really developed to assist community health and care professionals to take action and set patient-centered goals, encourage timely monitoring, guide escalation management, and guide when uh, non-nutrition experts should refer on to a dietitian for further expertise. Um, but also the tools were there to outline effective interventions that could be adopted in the community and the measures to both treat and prevent malnutrition with the ultimate aim of avoiding unnecessary deterioration uh, through uh, a poorer nutritional status and minimizing avoidable harm, which is very much uh, underpinned in the framework from the British Dietetic Association, which is a framework for screening for malnutrition. Uh, but as we've heard uh, throughout this morning, uh, food is more than nutrients. I know that many of you listening in today will know that the uh, food, be, uh, the value of food uh, extends beyond nutrients um, because it's so integral to our lives and companionship as well as sustenance. And uh, this quote here was from uh, the former chief exec at the hospice that I had the privilege of working at. Uh, which emphasised how nutrition should be integrated into all our care pathways, and I couldn't agree more. We know increasingly that patients and their families want to know about diet and nutrition and how it can influence their well-being, recovery and response to treatment. And therefore, we hope that all of the resources in the malnutrition pathway uh, look to uh, support both the healthcare professionals in everyday practice, but also support carers um, of uh, elderly people, those with diseases that affect nutrition, so that we can uh, optimize their health and well-being. So 10 years on, I'd like to think that the malnutrition pathway uh, is still being used really as a framework to guide uh, resources and uh, uh, information that can be adopted at a local level. Uh, I'd like to thank the incredible healthcare professionals who've been uh, along, um, uh, joined us along the way really to actually support the development of all the materials, as well as the patients and carers who've also got involved to ensure that the materials that we develop are those that are uh, best accepted by our patients and carers who require them. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope this has provided you with an insight into our work to date. Excellent, very interesting. I think it is good to, for you to explain how you plan and research and design all your excellent guidance. I particularly like top tips. Yeah. <laughs> Old, older people, carers, they love top tips. 
Yeah, I don't know for the healthcare professionals, you know, uh, busy GPs and other healthcare professionals, they read so much guidance these days. There's so much out there. We know our inboxes are full of emails about the latest guidance. So, so yeah, the top tips has really evolved over the last few years in response to yeah. many healthcare professionals saying, you know, we just need those like 10 top tips of what I can do tomorrow. And patients and carers are the same, like you say, Leslie, many patients carers when there's been surveys done by yourself within age uk and the malnutrition task force but also uh groups like matt mellon have identified that what people want is just those top tips you know sort of simple guidance that they can adopt tomorrow that's practical and acceptable and achievable as well yeah exactly and i think also it was i like to hear about how important it is to think about how you're talking what words we're using and how people understand it because we know that so many people don't understand what the NHS is talking about quite a lot of the time and because yeah. we're using the jargon and words every day we know what it means and I think it's really important that we as trying to raise awareness the whole time make sure that we very speak very clearly yeah and I think yes totally agree Leslie and I think a number of years ago I remember the work that uh, Age UK undertook uh, which was uh, looking at um, views of patients and carers on on malnutrition I I think when we use the term malnutrition with patients and carers I'd very much say we alienate them Um, you know and what we've tried to do with the pathway and and what I know the malnutrition task force has set out to achieve is is that speaking in a language so talking about loss of appetite, talking about issues that are interfering with food intake in a language that is meaningful to our patients and carers, Mm -hmm. um, probably then holds more resonance and helps them understand, you know, what is it about their uh, their condition um, that, you know, might interfere with their ability to eat and drink a normal diet. So they don't blame themselves for that, but recognize there's, there's actually physiological reasons behind that. But then explain to them in simple terms uh, uh, that, you know, loss of appetite and taste changes, things like that are all very common. But there are uh, sort of ways of actually uh, dealing with it, mm-hmm. at least in part. I think also it gives people the confidence then. So it gives the patient the confidence to come back and say, yes, but what about this? And yeah. that always has to be positive when it's a two way yeah, and I think that was the idea behind the the assessment is thinking about those prompts, you know, thinking when you've got you've got a client or a patient in front of you, you know, what what sort of things should you be asking them? You know, not just about the appetite, but have you noticed uh, any changes in your taste? Have you noticed any swallowing issues? You know, so I think as we move forward in managing and preventing malnutrition in particular, um, I think it's about being you know, anticipating that there may be problems down the line and trying to, you know, gear people up to optimise their nutrition at their earliest opportunity. And I think that's why sort of nutritional care now, we're looking to try and embed it early in care pathways. When people were diagnosed with the condition, they might be eating well, but how can we optimise their intake at that stage? Is it about protein and um, resistance activity? And then as their appetite starts dropping off, asking those questions using whatever tool is appropriate whether it's the uh you know the tool that uh, jane talked about um you know the brief questions to sort of ask get nutrition on the agenda ask if there are any issues arising get it up there get it out there (laughs) get it out there yes (laughs) well thank you so much and thank you for your time and thank you for such an interesting presentation yeah thank you for being part of this really special day